Great, so let's jump into conditional outcome modeling. Here is the adjustment formula for the average treatment effect that's hopefully reasonably familiar to you by now. So on the left-hand side, we have a causal estimate, and on the right-hand side, we have a statistical estimate. And we want to turn this statistical estimate into an actual estimate. We want an estimator that can take in data and then give us that estimate. So there's two things we'll need to do here. The first is to model these conditional expectations. Here we can use any statistical model that models this conditional expectation. So if you've used scikit-learn before, you can pretty much just take anything out of scikit-learn and plug it in to model this conditional expectation, assuming that it's minimizing the mean squared error of the true y's and the predicted y's given treatment and w. So you can even use fancy models like deep neural networks to model this conditional expectation. What I'm going to do now is rewrite this conditional expectation using mu. So I've just taken the thing on the top and rewritten it using mu to mean this conditional expectation. Now we get this estimator, where mu hat here is some model trained using mean squared error to predict outcome from treatment and w. And in order to approximate this expectation over w, we take a sum over all the data samples i, and then we use that i to index w here. And then, because it's a mean, we average, we normalize that sum. So we divide by 1 over n, where n is the number of samples. So that's how we get an estimate for the ATE using conditional outcome modeling. Here, mu is the conditional outcome model. And if you think back to the full examples where we included estimation in week 2 and week 4, we used a conditional outcome model estimator, or a COM estimator, where the specific model that we used was linear regression. Now, how might we extend this to estimation of conditional average treatment effects? Here is the average treatment effect COM estimator that we just saw. And here is the Kate estimate that we saw in the preliminary slide. On the rightmost side, we have the statistical estimate that we'll use to guide how we get an estimator here. Similar to the last slide, we'll define a mu. This mu is almost the same as the mu we used in the last slide, but now it also takes x as input and corresponds to an estimate that is conditioning on x. Now we can get a COM estimator for the CATE that looks just like the COM estimator for the ATE, except now x is also an input to this model mu hat here. So now when we train the statistical model, it also needs to take as input x. So the model that we train will train to predict y from treatment, w, and x. And additionally, this sum over i is only going to be for the samples where xi, so the sample where it's x equals this x here, for that defines the conditional average treatment effect, the specific kind of conditional average treatment effect that we're looking at. And similarly, this n sub x here is the number of such samples in that sum. If there's only one sample like that, you could still use that as the estimator for that CATE. And you could even call it an estimator for the corresponding ITE, the individual treatment effect for that example. And the first question of this lecture is what could go wrong with this estimator? COM estimation goes by many different names, and we're just going to list some of those names here so that you know what people are talking about when they say these things. The first is G computation estimators, where the G stands for generalized. This comes from the fact that when Jamie Robbins came up with these, these were for the generalization to time varying treatment. So if you imagine a graph where you have many nodes for treatment over time. 
where each of the treatment nodes is a different time point for that treatment. Another name you might see for COM estimation is parametric G formula, where G again here stands for generalized, for the same reason as G computation. The relevant statistical estimate there was originally called G computation formula. And the motivation for this name is that G computation commonly gets confused with this completely different kind of estimation called G estimation. So maybe people won't confuse G formula with G estimation as much as they confuse G computation with G estimation. The next is standardization. And you might also hear COM estimators referred to as S learners, where the S here stands for single because we fit a single model for mu. We'll soon see that you could imagine fitting more than a single model for mu. Now, imagine that we're using COM estimation in high dimensions. So the W vector here is high dimensional, and T is a scalar, only one dimensional. And we're fitting a model mu hat to this data. So here I've depicted a neural network, but you could imagine any model for this. It's reasonable to think that the model could ignore t here, because t is only one dimension in the high dimensional vector of input to the model. So say w is 100 dimensional, then t is one out of 101 dimensions. The model might not need t to predict why well, given these 100 other dimensions. So in a neural network or a linear regression, this means assigning zero to the weights that are coming out of T. Or it could even just be assigning really small values to those weights so that T isn't contributing much in the prediction for Y. So this kind of intuition might lead you to believe that COM estimation can be biased towards zero. So the ATE estimates might be a bit on the small side in absolute value. And in this paper here, they found some evidence for that. So the problem, to recap, is that our models could ignore treatment, leading to estimates of the ATE or CATE that are biased towards zero. This leads us to the natural question, how can we ensure that the model doesn't ignore T? The solution that we'll consider is what we'll call grouped COM estimation, or G-COM estimation. At the top here, I've copied the COM estimator for the ATE. And the G-COM estimator will be very similar, but it won't use the same model for mu. Rather, we'll use mu1 as the model for all the treatment equals 1 data, and mu0 for all the treatment equals 0 data. So we have two models here, mu1 hat and mu0 hat, where each is fit to a different treatment group. So if we draw a neural network again, we have a single neural network for the COM estimator, and this single neural network takes both treatment and W as input to predict Y. In contrast, for GCOM estimation, we would have two neural networks. One neural network for the treatment equals one group, so all the data that has t equals 1 will be used to fit this t equals 1 network, and another network for the t equals 0 data. That whole group of data will be used to fit the t equals 0 network. And then we don't need to use t as input to these networks. They only need to take w as input. t is encoded into the fact that we're using two different networks. So while in regular COM estimation, the single model is fit with all of the data, while in GCOM estimation, the first model is fit with all the treatment group data and none of the control group data, and the second model is fit with all the control group data and none of the treatment group data. This leads us to the problem that these networks might have higher variance than they would if they were trained on all of the data. Right, we might not be efficiently using our data. Now that we're at the end of this section, I'll leave you with the following question, which is, write down the general form of a COM estimator and a GCOM estimator. <laughs>